Good evening, everyone. My name is Jonas Staal. I'm an artist, propaganda researcher, and the main subject of the talk I want to share with you today relates to climate propagandas, meaning the different ideological narratives, the different imaginaries developed around the current climate catastrophe. To start, it's important to define what is propaganda. And through my own research, I tend to emphasize that propaganda is not a mere act of messaging but that as a practice propaganda aims to construct new realities as such. In, in that analysis I build on the work of uh, the likes of Noam Chomsky and Edward Herrmann, their book Manufacturing Consent written in the late 80s, in which they argue uh, that the role of the mass media and its propriety, proprietor ownership uh, aims to uh, construct a set of shared values in the interests of these very same proprietors. So three components in propaganda and propaganda art I'll, I'll be highlighting throughout this talk. The first is infrastructure, the second is narrative, and the first is imagination. When we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about an infrastructure like the mass media that Chomsky and Herman already uh, referenced, but we can also think of the infrastructures of politics, the economy, and the military industrial com complex, uh, technology, culture, all of which are necessary to create such a new normativity, an immersive environment in which a set of values can circulate and become an embodied uh, reality of a given community. The second component is narrative. Then we relate to, this relates to the <clears throat> origins stories that also give legitimacy to these infrastructures and their form of uh, ownership. So we can think, for example, of the um, Trump, Trump slogan, make America great again. It tells us something about uh, an imagined past, a present and a future. It's a kind of retro science fiction past because Trump calls upon us to return to a, a supposed um, sovereign white nation that never existed as such in the first place. It's also not desirable, but okay. Never existed in the first place and is then projected as our common future. But this gives an, an arch, this proposes a master um, narrative and it leads to the first third component, and that is imagination. The kind of world that propaganda aims to construct um, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the process. So maybe before going to the main subject, give you a little bit of context of my own uh, artistic practice. I divide it in two fields, propaganda research on one hand, propaganda work on the other. I will start with propaganda research. For me, propaganda research is about um, using the forms of installation, film, research projects to map how dominant structures of power use propaganda, use infrastructure, narrative and imagination to construct reality after their uh, interests. A recent example is a project called Steve Bannon, a propaganda retrospective, took the form of an exhibition uh, installation that I realized in 2018. <clears throat> and here I also begin to reference to the PDF uh, that I have sent you starting on uh, page one. Now, of course, Bannon is mostly known as ideologue of Trump, campaigner, uh, Trump campaigner, the co-founder of the alt-right uh, media platform Breitbart News. Lesser known is that he was also a prolific filmmaker. Between 2004 and 2018, he made about 10 different documentary film pamphlets. He calls them kinetic cinema, a cinema that aims to overwhelm its uh, audience <clears throat> and developed several cultural projects alongside. So on the first uh, page, you see Bannon's IMDb um, profile. On the second page, you see an impression of one of the five rooms of this uh, exhibition um, project, the Steve Bannon Propaganda Retrospective. And the aim of this project was to map how the cultural work of Bannon in, Bannon in a way prefigured what we have come to know as Trumpism. So it was an attempt to track how, trace how um, artistic imagination uh, proceeds and enables political transformation. If you look at page uh, three and four, you will see an image that might be familiar to, to some of you, Biosphere 2 in Oracle, Arizona, largest uh, created closed um, system structure uh, in the world, um, attempts to replicate different uh, plants and animal lives, different uh, um, uh, ecologies, and, and building and tr tr tries to build a kind of balance between them. Originally, Biosphere 2 was meant as um, experimental, uh, as a space to experiment for the future of space colonization. Is it possible to create a self-sustaining ecology 
on a planet that has a none, at least from a human perspective. Um, but the project went into an enormous financial crisis, and this is where Bannon came in. Bannon originally or originated from uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, and he was brought into this project as a venture um, capitalist. He repurposed the biosphere to research the consequences of climate change, in great contradiction to his um, key role in convincing Trump to step out of the Paris Climate um, Accord. Um, and on page five, uh, you see a model of the Biosphere 2 that was uh, presented in the exhibition project. Why do I find it important to, to um, um, reference such an early example of his, uh, of his uh, well, let's say, cultural organizational work? It's not exactly cultural work yet. Because I think the Biosphere is a, is a really good metaphor for uh, propaganda, for how to define propaganda. It's not about the messages we send to one another in the biosphere. It's about the very infrastructure of the biosphere as such that creates, creates an immersive, closed system environment. And essentially, the trajectory of Ben would be uh, to create his own alt-right biosphere in the process. On page uh, six, you see uh, another of the, the five rooms from the Steve Bannon, a propaganda retrospective exhibition project. Uh, here, um, uh, they, these are 10 screens. And on each of the screens, the dominant visual metaphors from all of Bannon's films are categorized. So it's a kind of encyclopedia of, of each and every one of his films. And on page seven, you see some stills that give you an impression. Uh, when it comes to his use of um, natural disasters and natural occurrences. Of course, we know in the context of climate catastrophe, there is nothing natural about them, but this is how he posits them uh, in, the in the film, the explosion of volcanoes, breaking of, uh, of icebergs. And in, his, um, in, his, in, the, in the core narratives of his film, they are always the first sign, these natural occurrences are always the first sign of a looming danger, of a coming, of a coming clash each of Bannon's films always leads to a clash of civilizations, which he believes is not a singular event, but is, an, is a generational event. Every four generations, the doctrine of white Christian economic nationalism has to reassert itself against various enemies from the inside and from the outside. And this is almost um, this is a prophetic given. This is a battle that must be uh, waged in a very um, in a, in a very effective way. Bannon merges these kind of natural or natural phenomena into images like you see on page eight and the f uh, flying banknotes, burning banknotes, tsunamis of banknotes. This is probably the most uh, reoccurring metaphor in all of his uh, films. And they stand for the moment that um, when societies reject uh, a divine entity, uh, reject divine, suprem uh, divine supremacy, uh, all value, all constructive value uh, uh, gets lost. Uh, so, of course, the dollar bill and its sentence, in God we trust, is becomes becomes a signifier for that uh, process. This unraveling of society and out of this unraveling, a new um, white Christian economic nationalist doctrine has to be uh, enforced against the various enemies. There are always the enemies on the inside. These tend to be the cultural Marxists that are trying to collectivize the state from, from within. These are, uh, on the other hand, the globalists, the globalist elite, the party of, uh, of Davos, as well as the enemy of Islamic terrorism, which uh, Bannon argues before was the threat of, of communism, the threat of Nazism, and these uh, generationally rearticulate itself. Evil has many faces, generation, generationally rearticulates itself uh, and challenges uh, great leaders to step to the fore. And of course, on page nine, you see a still from the, his latest film, Trump at War. And um, after he propagated the likes of uh, Ronald Reagan in his films, uh, Sarah Palin, leader of the Tea Party, now it is the time of Trump to step to the fore. But it's it's important to emphasize that that Bannon's, um, this, this Bannon's doctrine, the doctrine of white Christian economic nationalism that is central to, to Trumpism as well, was was developed visually, rhetorically, symbolically through a, 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 a long period well before Trump stepped to the fore. So this, this whole trajectory tells us in a very dark way something about the power of artistic imagine, uh, imaginary. Um, to shift <clears throat> for a moment from this aspect of propaganda research in my own practice, I would like to, to shortly discuss also what I refer to as my own propaganda work. Uh, 
Of course, after um, after these previous examples, it's it's maybe hard now to to think of propaganda as something else than than as something that is does not is not by definition related to to um, an authoritarian uh, politics. But there is a long history of the role of art um, in um, anti-colonial movements, in socialist movements, uh, in feminist movements, in ecological movements, in civil rights movements, and black liberation movements, uh, to articulate the, the, the visions, the imaginary horizon that uh, these movements uh, were trying to uh, create. There is, in other words, a history of emancipatory propaganda, and a propaganda that is not uh, created, is not imposed upon a people, but that is part of a social struggle, that is, in, that is an imaginary that that um, uh, that emerges from uh, collective uh, struggle. And in that uh, context, um, to that to that field of emancipatory propaganda art, I try to contribute uh, as well, exploring the role of art in contributing, propagating alternative imaginaries of new egalitarian uh, societies, uh, which in my case often uh, results in concrete and direct collaborations with uh, social movements, uh, progressive political parties, um, autonomous uh, governments, uh, and the like. A first example that I would want to give in this context of propaganda work is a long-running um, long artist organization uh, that I founded in 2012 called the New World uh, Summit. I will often refer to it as WE because I developed it uh, together with various other architects, designers, um, and essentially, the New World Summit consists of a series of alternative parliaments for stateless and blacklisted political organizations. So these large-scale architectural constructions that you can see on page 10, um, in, uh, in, in, in which, um, in the image that you see from 2012, first summit we organized in Berlin, you see these this flags organized by color surrounding the parliament. Each of these belong to uh, blacklisted uh, political organizations, blacklisted in the context of the war, the so-called war on um, terror. And for us, it was very uh, important to to challenge through these through this parliament, through this parliamentary space. And on page eleven, you see uh, some of the organizations that responded to our um, invitations, such as Basque Independence Movement, Kurdish Women's Movement, Filipino Underground, as well as the. Um, Azawadian independence movement in northern uh, uh, Mali. For us, it was very important in these spaces to challenge this this persistent um, master narrative in the war on terror of the us versus them, the us versus them dichotomy. Um, primarily by asking who exactly is us, what constitutes us. Is it possible that uh, we, as politicized citizens, um, as, cit as politicized citizens, have more in common that, that reject the war on terror, that we have more in common with uh, organizations that are being prosecuted in the same war than with the criminal governments that claim to act in uh, our name. And in many cases, that, that proved to be true. Just the, the um, representatives that you see on this on this image here, on image 11, and they um, each of them stems from long-standing anti-colonial and liberational uh, movements. It's certainly not that they reject democracy as is this kind of mythology of the terrorist as that which stands beyond, has to be placed outside of democracy, but also rejects the, the, the democratic doctrine. And they certainly have theories and practices of democracy, but they are too democratic for what capitalist democracy uh, uh, can, can and its military industrial complex can bear. On page 12 and uh, 13, you see another example of one of these alternative uh, parliaments, in this case uh, created in the Royal Flemish Theatre in Brussels, um, where we gathered 20 different representatives of stateless states, unrecognized states. <clears throat> um, and uh, as you will note, the, the kind of the visual form, the morphology of these parliaments tend to tend to change from one location to, to the other. It is, for me, the, the parliament um, as a performative space, it's also a space that can be in which it's, it's a space where we try to construct or try to um, choreograph new forms of communality, where we try to choreograph, compose a new us in relationship to a uh, them, and them in this case becomes not the terrorist, but the terrorist state, state, terror, state uh, terrorism. 
So an important, um, um, as you can see in page 14 and 15, it's a return to the more circular structure here, temporary uh, embassy for stateless organizations constructed in uh, Oslo uh, city, city Hall. Um, these, these, these spatial dynamics, they contribute to building um, a, uh, to, 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 to exploring uh, shared, uh, shared narrative. So in other words, I believe there's a very, there's a very intimate relationship between between form, between space, between spatial composition, and the possibility to come to uh, ideological and political um, outcomes. There is a performative component to uh, collectivity. From page uh, 16 onwards, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20, you will see the most recent chapter of the New World uh, Summit. It is an alternative uh, public parliament uh, commissioned by the autonomous Kurdish government in the northern part of Syria that declared itself independent in 2012 in the midst of the Syrian civil war and introduced a new political paradigm they refer to as stateless democracy, a practice of, of democracy without the state based on local communal self-governance, gender equality and uh, social ecology. And uh, the Kurdish movement has been involved with the New World Summit from the very beginning. A lot of their ideas, their political ideas shaped my artist organization as, uh, as well. And as a result, um, uh, I was invited with my team to develop this, this idea of the, of the public parliament. The parliament as a public space, as a monument, as a symbol to the sacrifices of the Rojava revolution and its political ideals, but also as a space to bring them concretely into um, practice. And as you can see on page 19, maybe most, uh, most clearly, the parliament uh, has its own form, obviously, but, but of course comes to its full manifestation the moment that it is that it becomes a parliament of bodies, that in a way the infrastructure largely becomes invisible. The new infrastructure is the, the infrastructure of the uh, commune itself. And the very close proximity between the circular center, the center of uh, power remaining empty, and, um, and, and what otherwise would be the public uh, tries to push for the idea, the ideal of a collective um, representation that is central to the uh, Rojava revolution. So that's for the New World Summit. Moving slowly towards the main issue of uh, main subject of climate propagandas. Um, a last example I would like to give you is a project um, that I um, organized in 2019 called Interplanetary Species Society. You can see um, the project starting from page 21 to page 24. And um, this has a little bit of resonance, this project has a little bit of resonance with the um, Steve Bannon propaganda retrospective because it tries to engage, re engage the, the, the construction of the biosphere in a different way. So what you see here is an underground um, experimental biosphere that I uh, developed in the uh, Reactorhallen in Stockholm. It's an underground former nuclear research facility. In the center you see the hole where the reactor used to, uh, where the reactor used to be. Um, and there I programmed together with different uh, climate activists and, and researchers um, and an ongoing, um, an ongoing assembly, an attempt to create an experimental assembly um, between human, non-human and other than human um, comrades, and we term them uh, specifically. So maybe the title Interplanetary Species Society refers, of course, to the fact that in the coming decade or so, we will become an interplanetary species. We, uh, the, the types of Elon Musk and their corporate agencies like SpaceX will attempt to create permanent human, human habitat on Mars. And they do so, uh, 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 this, and this endeavor um, has uh, reproduced a terrifying rhetoric when we think of this, even the term uh, Mars colony or or this new generation of so-called pioneers. It, it, it is structured on the worst um, imperialist, colonial and extractivist histories, which are exactly at the, at the foundation of why someone like Musk would argue for the need of a backup planet in the first place, because ours has become uh, uninhabitable, <clears throat> uninhabitable exactly because of these practices. So, but, it, but in the history of progressive science fiction, emancipatory science fiction, like that of the, of the early years of the Soviet Union, the, the idea of becoming interplanetary was always an emancipatory endeavor. It was always about expanding comradeship, expanding comradeship not only between uh, comrades living on Earth, um, but also with the, um, uh, the, uh, with other 
subjectivities, other comradely subjectivities in the uh, universe. And maybe if you go to page 24, you see one of the one of the spheres of this uh, experimental biosphere that that consists of proletarian plants, of meteorites, uh, humans, as well as these uh, fossil fossilized ammonites. So ammonites are um, a close family to octopus and squid, and they lived between 366 million years ago. They went extinct in the fifth uh, mass extinction. Um, and of course, that creates a strange, that creates a strange intimacy, a strange solidarity, maybe even between us as fossils in the making, in the midst of the sixth mass extinction, and them as witnesses uh, of the fifth mass extinction. So, despite the fact that our biological and historical trajectories are vastly different, uh, there is a a, a strange uh, uh, possibility of, um, of 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 learning and engaging even with these vast time scales that they represent. Uh, we tend to think when we discuss um, the, the, the dangers of the climate catastrophe, um, a reoccurrent claim is we need to think beyond our generations, our children and their grandchildren. But what these fossils represent are millions of years. We must demand a million years. We demand a million years. This could be the new uh, slogans for which we start to emphasize what a, um, a, a, a comradeship in a deep future, not only in a deep past, as what these ammonites represent, but in a deep future could or should be. Maybe important to note these neo-constructivist bodies um, upon which the ammonites are placed, of which they almost become the, the face, even though actually they are, of course, the shell. Um, they, uh, they reference, obviously, the movements of constructivists and productivists, the generation of avant-garde artists that emerged from the early years of the Soviet Union, and in which uh, artists like uh, Popova and Rochenko uh, argued very specifically for the idea that an object could be a comrade, so that in the, in the conditions of uh, revolution, um, objects would not merely be decommodified and become public property, they would become active agents themselves. They would become revolutionary entities themselves. And in the dialectic between revolutionary human and revolutionary object, a new type of um, revolutionary subjectivity would uh, emerge. So in this case, I expand this uh, constructivist heritage, this idea of the object as comrade into the field of non-human, other than human uh, subjectivities. All right, so this is a general um, general introduction, general framework um, to my research, my practice. Maybe we can discuss now, this last project also brings me to uh, the question of climate propaganda. So what are the infrastructures, the narratives, the imaginations that are developed around the current climate catastrophe and what is the role of art and culture in the process? An example could be the, um, if we take, let's say, libertarian and corporate ideology as an example, I already referenced um, referenced Musk, uh, Elon Musk. Then, then we see, first of all, that our looming extinction is um, most of all identified, first of all, identified as a resource, as a resource, extinction as a resource. So, so corporate and libertarian actors do not necessarily deny climate. Uh, change often they do, but they not, do not necessarily deny it. The, pro the, the issue is more that even if they if they recognize it, they will not take as a as a as an as a uh, consequence that a massive redistribution of wealth or investment in sustainable energy resources would be necessary. Rather, they will come to see this disaster, this this um, looming extinction, as a new market opportunity. And of course, geoengineering would be the most uh, famous example, as you can see, for example, on page. And 25, an image of the so-called Seasteading Institute, an organization founded by Peter uh, Field of, uh, of PayPal. He proposes to develop a kind of floating cities, so in our, on our drowned, on our presumed drowned world. We're not even still thinking about how to how to avoid that. He's already presuming it. The extinction brings about new resources. One of them is the drowned world. Upon this drowned world, um, he uh, the the Seasteading Institute, Seasteading Institute aims to build this kind of floating libertarian uh, 
um, cities. And of course, that stems from a, from a kind of Ayn Rand type of objectivist um, idea of um, a kind of corporate desire of replacing the state uh, altogether. And in this case, accelerating the, the climate crisis um, an ex accelerated climate crisis is, is just a path, a quicker path forward to make that ideal a reality. And to actually come to Musk, as you can see on page uh, 26, the um, uh, digital drawing of a uh, planned Martian human settlement in um, on uh, on Mars. Um, here, the um, here we 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 see uh, the the climate catastrophe. Uh, becoming a market to create the so-called backup uh, planet. A backup planet, first of all, to extract resources to bring back to Earth, but in time, if necessary, to create a permanent uh, settlement for the 1% to escape from the um, disasters that they have created on Earth in the first place. So here, ecocide becomes an invested opportunity. Uh, it tends to be pitched in this kind of like shiny, uh, 3D uh, imaginary that also evokes this biospherical uh, language that uh, that I, I showed before in relationship to the to the biosphere uh, two, following of course our original biosphere one, which is Earth itself. So in these examples, the examples of um, of the Seasteading Institute of um, SpaceX, the organization of Musk that creates this um, this Martian uh, settlement designs this Martian settlement, we see that infrastructure. The infrastructure at play um, are that of large corporations, such as that as uh, of uh, PayPal and uh, Tesla. This is what gives them the means. Um, this is what what produces the means to create these large scale um, uh, uh, geoengineering endeavors. And of course, paradoxically, they're very companies, and the, the the tendency of these companies to have a strong extractive um, extractive nature accelerates the climate crisis that becomes their own resource to pitch their uh, seasteading institutes and SpaceX uh, political project. Then the central narrative is that the, the climate catastrophe does not only open new resources, it is essentially itself a, a new, a, a new uh, resource, uh, resource that allows new forms of corporate governance, expansion of corporate governance, it's not manifested fully already, and a further and a withering away of the state, but not a withering away of the state in the kind of um, progressive uh, uh, Marxist sense, uh, but as one that just uh, uh, replaces a far worse um, uh, governing or ungoverning infrastructure. The final component after infrastructure narrative is that of the imaginary, and the imaginary that is proposed here is one of a hyper individualized colonial adventurism it kind of these images also tend to lure the public to think that they could be the chosen chosen ones to survive on floating islands or mars colonies while of course in truth these climate propagandas presuppose the sacrifice of the masses for the survival of a tech uh, elite and so this in relation as a case study of how we can think of um, uh, climate propaganda in relationship to corporate and libertarianist uh, libertarian uh, ideology. A second example um, that I want to discuss is that of climate fascism. And of course, a, a persistent progressive myth is that we need to somehow convince climate deniers to become believers in uh, climate change. But the problem, of course, is that when they do, this will not result in an embrace of um, progressive policies. Instead, they will use the climate catastrophe to double down on their claim who has a superior racial right to survival and who has not. And in recent uh, months, policies like that of herd immunity that were experimented in, in the United Kingdom as well as in um, the Netherlands during the coronavirus uh, pandemic, they lay the seeds for this eco-fascist logics of um, population engineering. With, with, with climate fascism comes almost automatically the question of population control, the, the fiction of overpopulation. A good example in popular culture is the, the viral hashtag Thanos did nothing wrong, hashtag Thanos did nothing wrong, which was popularized like through online platforms such as Reddit. And for those who are not familiar, Thanos is a character in the superhero franchise, The Avengers, who um, in the latest uh, chapters of the film, 
annihilates half of the population in the universe to solve the problem of supposed overpopulation. The, the interplanetary, the, 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 inter, the, the, the universal problem of overpopulation, not just on Earth, but beyond. Um, and Trump himself cashed in on the growing support for these kind of ideas of genocidal engineering. And the, the, the hashtag finals did nothing wrong, essentially is, is arguing, well, this, this was a this was a rational, this was a rational um, uh, decision. Trump cashes in on that um, in his growing support for genocidal engineering by appearing in an official Trump war room video as Thanos. You can see it on uh, still on page 27. You can see the video um, online uh, adopting the character's words, I am inevitable. So this shows, um, th th this, this, this shows how um, the, the, the climate catastrophe is, is, tends to strengthen, tends to accelerate existing uh, ideologies. We already saw it in the kind of libertarian and corporate uh, context in which they see climate uh, catastrophe as a, as, a, as, a, as a speeding up of their um, libertarian uh, uh, utopias. Uh, but that comes the same for the white nationalist alt-right agenda of the likes of uh, Trump. And it brings about its own kind of popular po popular culture or reinterpretation and um, um, repurposing of popular culture. Unfortunately, this climate fascist propaganda and its kind of key um, signifiers like that of, of population are not exclusive to ultra-nationalist and alt-right forces. A recent film, Planet of the Humans, you can see uh, the poster on page 28, you can see it online for free, directed by Jeff Gibbs, produced by Michael Moore, makes actually a very similar case as is made in the hashtag finals did nothing wrong narrative. Gibbs, throughout the film, Jeff Gibbs, the director, argues on extremely faulty and, 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 and um, outdated data that solar and wind energy energy demand more fossil fuels to be produced than that they actually generate energy uh, themselves and instead very quickly gibbs moves claims the pro problem actually lies in overpopulation it's not the global capitalist system that is overbearing it's humans and extractivist human nature itself that is overbearing this is also a very reactionary uh, tendency this this idea of humans as the uh, as the real virus instead of a particular system and an elite of humans that benefits uh, from it. As well, and also in this narrative, the higher birth rate of the global south is identified as culprit. And this is the this is the, the natural consequence. This is why the likes of Breitbart News, all right uh, media um, platform, has immediately embraced Planet of the Humans. Fantastic leftists moving towards uh, uh, right wing rhetoric, or at least supporting. Uh, willfully or not uh, a right-wing political agenda. So uh, overpopulation, the overpopulation narrative is instantly racialized if it's not inherently racialized and stands in harsh contrast with the fact that the global north might have a lower birth rate, but it has an excessive consumption and emission and the largest stake in the climate uh, catastrophe uh, as such. So we can say that if we look at infrastructure narrative imaginary in this climate propaganda of um, in this propaganda of climate fascism um, the infrastructure of climate fascist propaganda is diverse in the case of uh, trump the example of the of, of trump's war room video the infrastructure it is the, it is the infrastructure of the federal state as such uh, and the mass massive uh, campaign funding infrastructure that he has um, at his uh, disposal the narrative employed is obviously that of white nationalism and argues for a racial framework for uh, genocidal engineering, building on his pre-existing uh, master narrative, make America great uh, again. And that's also the imaginary of the, that this propaganda tries to bring forward, that of a, of a mythical white sovereign um, uh, nation state that is fully legitimized in the engineering of um, unwanted uh, bodies or those declared non-citizen or not entitled to um, uh, not entitled to the very no to the very description of being human uh, as such. Um, 
maybe to move to a final example, um, to a climate propaganda that might actually be worth studying. I mean, the example so far are worth studying to know who our opponents are. A propaganda, propaganda, climate propaganda worth studying might be that of the Green New Deal, probably to all of you well familiar, developed in various policy platforms in the past decades, ranging from that of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to that of, uh, of Yanis Varoufakis and his Democracy in Europe 2025 movement. And of course, their um, New Deal styled idea of a green industrial revolution is uh, problematic. It's problematic and due to its embrace of this very notion of progress and the very notion, the, the, the embrace of, a, of an idea of, of a linear progress that is, uh, that, that, that is presupposed uh, by this, um, this term. And of course, that exactly that linearity and that acceleration is also inherent to uh, our industrial and, uh, and extractivist um, heritage of which, well, the dark consequences we are facing, uh, facing now. Nonetheless, what is extremely imp important about uh, the Green New Deal is that it recognizes the agencies of um, climate change, meaning that it, it recognizes that, um, that the capitalocene, that our heritage of, 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 um, uh, of extraction has also unleashed uh, forces in, our, in the ecology of which we are also part of, um, that show that it's not only uh, humans that unmake other e ecological actors, it can very much be the other way ar around as well. So, so the, the climate catastrophe unleashes new agencies from um, plastic to tsunamis um, to, to massive uh, toxic fires. Um, and and from, that, from that very, very fundamental um, um, say it's a, a, a approach, um, comes the consequence that the Green New Deal does not aim to geoengineer the climate back to an old normal. It doesn't have this nostalgic narrative of a return to a, a past and that never existed in the first place. Instead, the Green New Deal argues we need to transform with the uh, climate, meaning climate change is a chance to challenge the capitalist, colonial, extractivist nature of the systems that shape our current world. And as a result, the Green New Deal aims for massive investment in sustainable infrastructure, planetary wide wealth redistribution, recognition of frontline leadership of indigenous communities and peoples of color, as well as colonial reparations and so forth. And culturally, this translates, if you go to image uh, 29, uh, in, in many um, different uh, visual uh, vocabularies. Here I took the example of the Green New Deal poster series that were, was developed by Ocasio-Cortez with uh, the design collective uh, Tandem. And of course, this imagery um, is uh, reminiscent of the muralist art that was popularized uh, through the federal art project of Roosevelt's New Deal. So it literally also makes a link to the aesthetics of the uh, old New Deal or emphasizes solidarity or continuity with these uh, with these aesthetics in the in the present and of course in our present that means it also plays into this a very dominant vintage culture in which we are currently um, existing in which uh, uh, polaroid cameras are, are reissued and obviously they also have usb entries and everything but in terms of the design they remain the same the, the, the return of the lp in a time in which materialities become more ephemeral and, uh, um, and and digitized this return to a kind of um, um, authentic vintage uh, reel, although it tends to be kind of mockeries of the reel, simulacras of a former reel uh, have become extremely, um, extremely popular. Um, and, and of course, this vintage culture tends to be uh, very centered to kind of reactionary propaganda, so return to, to, to a greatness of the past. But in this case, the vintage filter is used in a very, I think, very intelligent way. It's used to propagate a future horizon of a reality that can be constructed through the, the Green New Deal. It emphasizes, it is used to emphasize a historic uh, continuity, but it, that is not the same as a return uh, to that history it is employed to enable a new or different futurity. Now, a step further than this um, example of climate propaganda of the Green New Deal is taken by the collective of artists, academics, and indigenous organizers known as Not an Alternative. They have a, uh, an, 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 I think, extremely important ongoing project. It's called the Natural History Museum, which essentially it's kind of like a, almost a propaganda train 
like version of the Natural History Museum um, that aims to reclaim natural history as a, as a site of common struggle, as a site of uh, a struggle and alliance. They create, for example, if you look at page uh, 30, alternative dioramas that shows a depiction of nature not external to extractivist industry. So not this, this universalized idea of nature, something that stands beside um, human industrial activity, space and time, but is actually directly shaped by these very um, industries. Uh, so this the, the conception of nature that is represented in not an alternatives natural history museum is one in which um, and capitalos, the industries of the capitalocene have a, a fundamental uh, constitutive role. At the same time, <clears throat> they also highlight the role of fossil fuel sponsorship to um, natural history museums. That is uh, also represented in some of the dioramas. You don't see them on this picture, uh, which is quite crucial because the, there is a huge fossil fuel sponsorship in natural history museums because, of course, fossil fuel industries have an interest in maintaining the idea of this of nature as purity, as of nature as something that stands somehow beyond their own extractivist uh, endeavors. Uh, and further, very important about not an alternative's work, if you look at page um, 30, uh, 31, is their close collaboration with indigenous movements such as the Lumination, which is which you see a uh, uh, work, a collaborative work of which you see represented uh, here, in which they try to create. Uh, through these collaborations, create new assemblies around the idea, an idea of nature structured on a, on a specter they refer to as primitive communism. Primitive communism would be at the foundation of the emancipatory natural history that not an alternative proposes. In other words, that is a communism of shared rights, shared rights between human and other than human uh, comrades that predates the colonial and industrial project but that has remained as a specter even within our current um, capitalist societies nonetheless. So in these examples from um, the Green New Deal to not an alternative, we see that infrastructure is less vast, obviously compared to the likes of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of Musk, um, and instead organized by grassroots movements, progressive institutions, so potentially sometimes museums or contemporary art spaces can share in these, in these agendas, um, as well as um, uh, leaders amongst uh, uh, indigenous leaders. So the infrastructure is less vast. It is, it is a very dedicated. It is constructed of a collective sense of, of solidarity, but it doesn't have the same scope as some of the previous examples that I gave. The narratives they propose are maybe as a way even to compensate all the way stronger. Um, claiming the, the climate catastrophe as a moment to recognize ecological agencies beyond a human centered and in industry driven economy and aim their narratives aim for deep social, political, economic and cultural transformation instead. So the, the, let's say the, the, the simplicity of the Make America Great Again, the simplicity of this um, nostalgia-driven uh, narrative is rejected for a much more profound, fundamental, in, in some way um, exciting, as in agitating, arousing uh, narrative that enables a pos possibility of new future, while at the same time, especially in the case of primitive communism, emphasizing an equality between uh, future, present and past. And then the third component, from infrastructure to narrative is the imagination, the imagination that these climate propagandas from the Green New Deal to not an alternative bring into being. The balances between green social democracy, in the case of Ocasio-Cortez, to something more profound in the form of a resurgent primitive uh, communism, um, as in the case of not an alternative. So I'm going to uh, close here after 45 minutes. I hope that I was able to highlight in this short introduction that Propaganda is a practice of reality construction, not of mere uh, communication. It relies on these uh, returning, uh, uh, intersecting components, infrastructure, narrative, imagination. It's not a singular term, propaganda. Um, it is a term that we should understand in the plural. Different forms of power generate different propagandas in the plural, as we could see that climate propagandas are not singular either, and fundamentally different in um, their infrastructure, <clears throat> narrative and imagination, depending of whether we're talking about uh, climate fascism or the Green New uh, Deal. So they, um, 
So even though they are centered around the same event, climate catastrophe, the realities they aim to construct are fundamentally different. And that uh, makes visible that we find ourselves today in a propaganda struggle in which different propagandas fight over the conditions of human and other than human futures, the possibility of some form of meaningful uh, survival, which at least is the case in the uh, climate propaganda of the Green New Deal and not an alternative. I think in that process, in this process, in this propaganda struggle, art and academia cannot stay neutral. Propaganda uh, power is everywhere, and that also means that propaganda is everywhere. And that opens the question to us, uh, namely, which world do we want to contribute to propagate into being? That's the question I look forward to discussing with you now.